Hello and welcome to this flip classroom video um, looking at sea level change. Now when it comes to your AS exam you need to know about two different types of sea level change eustatic change and isostatic, isostatic change. You also need to know the sorts of geographical features that we find as a consequence of each of these different types of process. This video is designed for you to watch, pause, rewind, make notes on in order to make sure that we can target our target exam questions when we come into our lessons next week. So, starting point then, let's start to think about sea level in general, okay? I know you're very excited about this. So, sea level, or sea level that's relative to the land has changed many, many times throughout history. Um, so, sea level is not always at the level that it has been today. Um, usually, um, this change is due to the advance and retreat of ice on the land, okay? When I say advance, what I mean is when we've got more ice stored on the land, sea levels are generally lower as a consequence of the ice storing the water on the land. Okay, and then there are other times in periods of warming, like we're in at the moment, where ice on the land melts from glaciers, flows into the sea, and quite often uh, we see sea levels rising as a result of glacial retreat. Now, in terms of different sea level changes, effectively there are four stages that we need to know about. There we go, in case you were in any doubt, four stages. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of these four different stages to explain how sea levels might vary and change in space and place and time. So, stage one. This is when the climate gets colder, okay? So when we go through a period where we've got a cold climate, um, we get a glacial period. And what this basically means is that when the climate of the Earth gets colder, we get more precipitation which forms a snow, which leads to accumulations and forms glaciers, okay? So in other words, when it's colder, we get a lot of snow, which eventually turns to form lots and lots of glaciers. Now, that obviously will have effect on sea level changes. So as part of this stage one, where you've got snow and ice in glaciers stored on the land, what actually happens is the hydrological cycle, or the water cycle, slows down. So in other words, there's not as much water being cycled around that system going back into the sea because as soon as it's evaporated and then it forms this precipitation or it condenses and then forms precipitation in the form of snow on the land, it falls and it gets stored as glaciers, okay? Now, obviously, if that moisture is being stored on the land because the hydrological cycle has slowed down, that is going to leave us with falling sea levels okay and we call this very special name eustatic fall okay and that is absolutely crucial so that's kind of stage one which explains how we get eustatic fall in the numbers or in the amount of moisture or water that there is in the sea creating our sea levels then we start to move on to stage two because this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated now, in stage two, you've got the weight of the ice on the land, okay, which actually causes it to sink. Well, this kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got a seesaw and you put lots of weight on one end, obviously the seesaw is going to move and it's going to sink, okay? Now, obviously, if the weight of the ice on the land causes it to sink, okay, um, this movement is what we call isostatic movement, okay, and it can moderate eustatic sea level change, okay. Now that sounds very, very complicated at the moment, but what I'll do is I'll show you a little seesaw diagram in order to be able to explain what's going on, okay. So what you've got here is ice being stored on the land, okay, and that causes the land to sink because of the weight, which is called an isostatic sink, okay. So obviously, as a consequence, of that your sea levels are going to rise relative to your land okay because your land is sinking so your sea levels come up much much higher and that's our isostatic sink on the other side I've got our eustatic change okay that's what I explained in stage one okay so if there's less hydrological or water going around the hydrological cycle sea levels are going to fall Okay, so we know what isostatic, isostatic sink is and eustatic changes or eustatic fall. What we now need to know is, okay, stage three. Now, in stage three, the climate gets warmer. Now, obviously, if the climate gets warmer, what happens is glaciers start to melt. Now, obviously, this increases the amount of water that's in the sea, which causes eustatic rise. Okay, simple as that. 
Okay, so climate gets water, well, warmer, glaciers melt, uh, increases stores in the sea, and we get eustatic sea level rise, okay, which is kind of the period that we're in at the moment with global warming. Um, and lower land areas will tend to flood, okay, so places like modern day Bangladesh obviously going to find themselves in problems as a consequence of eustatic rise in sea levels, okay. Now this is where things start to hot up a little bit, not literally, uh, because we get lots of features that are created because of this. Okay, Now because these features are submerged underneath the land because of eustatic rise, we call them submergent features and we get two features in particular, fjords and rears. And I've put more on these later because you're going to need to be able to explain the formation of both fjords and rears and that comes a little bit later on in this video clip. Then we get to our next stage, which is stage four, okay? So what happens is the ice is removed um, and the land goes back to its original levels, okay? So in other words, it kind of, once the ice has gone off, okay, what happens is the land slowly starts to rise up again. Again, it's a little bit like your seesaw. If your person gets off the end of it, your seesaw is going to start to rise up and we call that isostatic readjustment, okay? Now it says there, if the readjustment is quicker than the eustatic change, so in other words, if the land starts to rise back upwards quicker, okay, then we've got all of that material being stored on the earth and creating that eustatic change. We get a feature which is called raised beaches, okay, and I'll explain again a little bit more about raised beaches in a second, okay. So, I mentioned that we get submergent features, okay? So if you understand how sea levels change, you now need to understand some of the different features that we find as a consequence of them. Now the first one that I'm going to talk you through is a feature which is called a rear. Now a rear is a submergent feature. So what this basically means is we get an increase in sea levels, and as we get an increase in sea levels, the river valleys down in the lower course of the river get flooded, okay? And this causes the floodplain of those rivers to completely disappear. However, it is only the lower levels, okay, so it's only sort of the lower and middle courses that get flooded. So those hills that we find in the upper and middle course of the river, they remain as sort of like little hills dotted out around this massive area of floodland, okay? And because of this, those valleys that were originally had a river flowing through them become effectively deep bays, okay? Um, so what I can do is I can show you a little diagram that can kind of hopefully help us to explain that process in a little bit more detail. So here you've got a cross profile and a long profile. So in the long profile, here you can see this would have been the lower course of the river, this would have been the middle course of the river, and this would have been the upper course of the river. The lower course and the middle courses are flooded, just leaving these areas of high land at the top. Now this is a cross section of a valley, okay? So if this is an upper course, this is one valley, this is another valley side here. Here you can see in the middle you've got this flooded area, okay, which is known as the creation of our rear. Okay, so you can see that down there. Now if you need more information on this, have a look on YouTube, have a look on Google, have a look at the notes that I've given you in class to help you to try and explain how these rears form because you need to understand what they are and you need to know how they work. Okay. Now as with all features, we need to make sure that we can give examples. Okay. So here is an example of a rear. I put Milford Haven, which is in South Wales. Okay. So if you went down to Milford Haven, you'd find your submergent feature. Okay, and that would be your uh, rear. Now obviously remember, submergent means that it's flooded. Okay, the next submergent feature, you might have heard of this one, is called a fjord, okay? Now fjords are very, very famous in places like Norway, okay? So fjords are essentially valleys that have been carved by glaciers. So you can see that here, can't you? You can see your steep valley sides, You've got your water in the middle, okay, and the glacier has punched its way and it's carved its way through this valley. Now we call it a hanging valley because it's got those sheer drops on either side of it, okay, and it forms that distinctive U shape that we might see. Now fjords are so deep, okay, in fact most of them are more than a thousand meters in terms of depth, okay. So what's happened is these old valleys where the ice has carved this massive U shape have become flooded because sea levels are rising, okay, and all we're left with is these steep sides on either edge and this massive deep area underneath it, okay, uh, which is the cause of our fjords. Okay, now, 
Some things that you need to know about fjords, okay? Fjords are not actually at their deepest at the mouth, okay? They have a shallow section towards the end. So if this is our long profile or our long section, here would be the mountains, okay? Here's one side of the fjord with the hanging valley. And then we've got these big deep fjords and you get this little shallow sec section over here, which is known as the threshold, okay? So you can see here the mouth of the river going into the sea. It kind of rises up, which is a little bit strange, okay? Okay, those are your two submergent features. You need to know how they form and you need to know what submergent is. The next thing you need to know about are what we call emergent features, okay? Now, emergent features, okay, are things like raised beaches, okay? Now, you all know what a wave cut platform is, okay? So, over the years, when sea levels have been at various different levels, you've got wave cut platforms that are formed at different depths depending on how steep or how deep, sorry, the sea is, okay? So, sometimes you might find when you go to visit somewhere, particularly up in the islands of Scotland, you've got one wave cut platform and then if you look carefully you've got another wave cut platform below it and another wave cut platform below it and that's because sea levels have constantly been changing, eroding and creating new wave cut platforms. Now I've put pictures up there, if you google um, King's Cave in Arran which is in Scotland, that's A -A, uh, sorry, A R R A N, and I'll pop that over in a second, you can actually see some massive examples of these raised beaches and it can start to make sense how they form. Okay, So I've put Aaron Scotland, there's your example, okay, and I've also put it's not uncommon to get caves, arches, stacks and stumps, and this is particularly impressive in Aaron because you can see the caves, the arches, the stacks and the stumps, okay, but they're at a much higher level to the water level and that's because sea levels have fallen and risen due to isostatic, uh, isostatic and eustatic change, okay. Right, that's quite complicated. You need to make sure that you rewind, that you pause, and that you go over anything that you don't understand. You also need to make sure that you make use of the resources that have been photocopied from the textbook for you so that you can get all of those independent notes down. If there's anything you still don't understand, you've got Google at your fingertips. Use your independent research skills to find out. Write down any questions that you may have. Come and find me, send me an email, and we'll see if we can make sense of them. Now you should be ready to answer exam questions which looks at features such as rears and fjords. Over and out.